Okay, let's consider another reaction that you've probably, uh, I mean, you've un undoubtedly seen in your life, uh, not, perhaps not really considered in a lot of detail, and it's the melting of ice. So you've got, say, a mole of ice, solid water, and it, it melts. Um, intuitively, you probably know that you've got to put energy in to get that to happen. You've got to transfer some heat in. So you know it should be endothermic. Let's consider the reaction. So we have here our reaction H2O as a solid, that's ice, going to H2O as a liquid. You would, in general language, call that melting. Okay. In the language of thermodynamics, there's another name for it, and we call it fusion. Okay. That always confused me. That name confused me when I was an undergrad. But anyway, that's what it's called. So if we worked out the enthalpy change for that reaction, we could say, what's the reaction enthalpy for this uh, reaction? Or you could even write um, the fusion enthalpy for this reaction. Well, it's going to be equal to, as we know, it's going to be equal to the formation enth enthalpy for H2O. Uh, whoops, correction, I lost my, I made my H for enthalpy into an H for H2O. Uh, sorry about that. H2O liquid, right, minus the formation enthalpy, this standard formation enthalpy for H2O as a solid. And that actually turns out to be uh, minus 286 kilojoules per mole minus minus a negative 292 uh, kilojoules per mole, which equals about 6 kilojoules per mole. And that's the enthalpy of fusion. So we know that that must be, I mean, you can see the sign there, it's positive. So therefore, it is endothermic. And that makes some intuitive sense. <clears throat> what might surprise you is actually the other way. I mean, mathematically, you know, if it goes the other way, the sign's got to be negative. But it's uncommon that you think about solidification. You get an ice cube, solidify, well, water solidifying to an ice cube, and you don't think of that as being exothermic because it's it's cold. To, you know, our human, you know, you can touch it and it feels cold. But in fact, it is. It's exothermic, and it's really neat. If you take a bottle, a clean bottle of, of water, and leave it outside when it's about minus seven or so, um, if you uh, you know live in an area where that's uh, possible, right? You leave it uh, outside, and it slowly cools. You can actually get super cool water, and because it's in a clean bottle with no little scratches inside it, anything you haven't opened or anything, um, you're, it's it's possible, quite possible, that you will get it cooled down to minus seven, minus eight, something like that. And so it thermodynamically should be in the solid state, but it's retained the liquid state. It's known as a metastable phase, or it's um, it's super cooled water, and so it's just lacking the activation energy to get the transformation to occur. And if you shake that you will initiate the transformation, you get a little bubble that provides a nucleation site for the solid, and you'll see the solidification for it, and it'll solidify. And um, you know, sometimes it happens by accident, you leave a bottle in your car overnight or something like that, and you pick it up to drink it, and it solidifies. It's, it's amazing if you ever see it. If you get it just at that right temperature, which is about minus 7, minus 8, the other thing you'll notice, which is fascinating, I think, is you think, oh, okay, it's minus 7, it should be completely solid, right? But in fact, you pick it up, and it's slushy. It's slushy. Why is it slushy? It's slushy and it's at zero degrees. If you put a thermocouple in, you'd see it's zero degrees C. Why is that? Well, that's because it started off at minus seven, but as the crystallization or the solidification occurred, you got that exotherm and energy was released as heat and remelted some of the ice. So you end up with now the slush that's a ice and, and, and uh, liquid in equilibrium. Let's now take some of that knowledge that we, we have there and see if we can present this another way. So, what we could do is we could plot for, for water. Okay, we're going to stick with water because that's intuitive, I think. And we're going to plot the temperature. And I'll leave it in degrees C just for simplicity. And we're going to go between the 0 and 100. And we're going to plot it versus the heat um, supplied or transferred in, heat supplied. And so then what we're going to see is, as you expect, is you heat it up, 
you're going to put some energy into the system and it's in the temperature and that's going to cause the temperature to go up but then you're going to hit this this region right here right where the temperature remains the same but you're still applying heat why is that well that is what we just talked about that is the enthalpy of fusion okay which is equal to we just said 6 kilojoules per mole okay and then what happens well then once you've got it all transformed you start to get the liquid phase heat up the water heats until you hit 100 degrees and then 100 degrees again you see this this isotherm now you notice i've actually drawn this larger a longer plateau and why is that well that's because more heat is required this is about 41 kilojoules per mole to transform to vaporize this is the enthalpy of vaporization okay and where did you see that before well just as a little side note right you don't have to well, anyway, you, you, you pay attention, you don't have to overly worry about it, but when we plotted previously Gibbs energy versus temperature, what I did was I said, hey, let's position the enthalpy there, right? That was our intercept, okay? And then we had the, enth we had the enthalpy for, this was for the solid, this was for the liquid, and then what, what I did, and I said it was accurate, but I didn't really elaborate on it, was the enthalpy for the gas uh, it was, was higher, right? And you'll remember then what we did is, you know, we, we, we plotted these lines and we explained um, some of the observations we had around solidification and so on. I didn't get that exactly right, but what we, we saw was, what we saw here was, I'll, I'll identify it here, right? This was the enthalpy of vaporization. It's more than the enthalpy of um, of, um, of melting, of fusion. Sorry. Okay. So we saw that previously. We even saw that when we very the very first time we looked at the formation of solid sodium chloride, and I, I gave you the vaporization enthalpy for the sodium going from the solid to the gas, and I said that the most of the energy was involved in going to the gas phase, and relatively speaking little was involved in the melting so we've seen that again right we're seeing all these beautiful pieces come back come together from different parts of the course um, and then finally of course what you're going to do is you're going to continue to heat now the gas phase up above 100 degrees so what i'd like to do is just address here fine so we've, we've you know we've kind of seen application of these these this, these enthalpies fusion and vaporization but what does this slope represent okay well, what are the units of slope? I, you know, I find it quite insightful to look at the, just the dimensions. Well, it has, has units of um, well, temperature change. I guess I should do it uh, this way. It's going to have units of Kelvin, right? Because what is it? Del the slope is delta T upon Q. So it's going to have heat, uh, sorry, temperature units, Kelvin, um, over our, our heat supplied, and that's going to be in kilojoules per mole so per mole we can bring them all up to the top so those are the units of it <clears throat> and if we wanted then to calculate say calculate um, the heat required say to heat liquid by a certain amount without a transformation, right, not accounting for vaporization or fusion, just within one of these sloped regions, right, only in the sloped region, we would say, well, the Q has to be equal to, if this is <coughs> um, units of, kil uh, sorry, Calvin mole per kilojoule, <coughs> if I bring the um, heat up and the slope down, we're going to have Q is equal to 1 over the slope, if you will, right, just intuitively, times delta t okay and the units i said has the mole in it there so if i wanted to account for the number of moles i could say q equals m the number of moles times that one over the slope times delta t but one over the slope seems like something pretty important right it's this property is specific to a specific material and so in fact it is it's um 
It's known as the, the heat, ca heat capacity. Or specifically, the one I've written here is the molar heat capacity. So this is the number of moles. This is the molar heat capacity. And of course, that's the temperature change. So, that's actually a very useful equation for calculating temperature changes or heat requirements uh, for a temperature change. And one other way you'll see this written is sometimes like this, or, uh, whoops, it's supposed to be an or, or, there we go, or if you wanted to express it instead of units um, of moles, if you wanted to use mass, then you could have the mass times <coughs> little c, which is called the specific heat, times delta t. And you'll appreciate here that that is essentially the same, just has a different set of units to calculate it, or units for the property. And so this is going to be the mass in kilograms or grams, whatever mass units you've got uh, consistent with this specific heat. It's known as specific. Specific, the word specific just means uh, on a per mass basis. So, you know, the specific heat there uh, has units of <coughs> joules per gram Kelvin. Okay. Um, and of course, temperature change uh, is consistent with what I had up above. Molar heat capacity, I'll write this in here. This has got units of joules per mole Calvin, as I indicated above, but just to clarify. So these are both um, fine forms of the uh, equation for calculating those uh, heat changes, um, just two different ways. It's sometimes tabulated specific heat or heat capacity. All right, thanks a lot.